Welcome. We are so glad you could join us for this online worship as we come to receive God's gifts of forgiveness and grace. And what a joy it is to be able to share that with you. Before we begin, I want to share a really important announcement with you. We are beginning to, our, to start our planning study. Um, this comprehensive survey of our entire Trinity family uh, is going to enable us to determine the potential support for major fundraising effort. If we as a community choose to move forward, the study is also going to provide us with information to assess the level of support, to identify possible campaign leaders, and to establish a realistic campaign goal. We're asking all of you to share your input and your thoughts regarding these plans. Every member should have received an, a mailing or an email with details on this vision. And everyone is asked to participate in a brief interview or to complete a survey. The completed surveys can be mailed back into the church office or placed in one of the offering baskets if you happen to come to worship in person. I would ask you to get this completed in the next three weeks. After all this information has been collected and compiled by the Steyer Group, our development firm, and presented to us, we are going to come to you with an informed decision about how to address these needs. I really believe that this is a, an important part of this process of our church moving forward, and I want to encourage all of you to participate. Your input is valuable as we plan the process for the future of Trinity Lutheran Church. So thank you for participating. And now we continue with our opening song. the 
Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue with the confession of sins and absolution. We confess to you, Lord, our sins of thought, word, and deed. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart, nor our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us. As a called and ordained servant of the Word and by God's authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, as you gather disciples from near and far, count us among those who boldly confess Jesus Christ as Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. This is the time in our service when we worship the Lord with our offerings. We want to thank you for your continued support of Trinity's ministries and invite you to give uh, either by mailing a check into the Mission Campus office or by going online using one of our online options. Also, if you or someone you love is going through a difficult season in life, we would ask you to send those prayer requests in to the Mission Campus office so that we as a community of faith can be lifting those situations up in the weeks ahead. The first lesson for today comes from Isaiah 51, verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson, which also forms the basis for our sermon for today, comes from Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 33. O oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor, or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him 
and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join now in our children's message video. Hey everyone, can you tell what a person does for their living, their job, just by looking at them? Well, it's not always easy, but sometimes if they wear a special hat or uniform, it might make it easier to tell what they actually do. So I brought some hats with me today and we're going to take a look. So if someone was wearing a hat like this, what would they do? Well, you're right. They would be a sailor, someone who sails on the seas, right? Well, keeping that in mind, if you saw someone wearing a hat like this, who do you think they are? They're a pirate. You're right. Now, if they were wearing this hat, what would they be? Well, they could be a couple of things. They could be a construction worker, or more than likely, they're a miner so that they can see where they're going. Then I have this hat. If you wore this hat, what would you be doing? That's right, you would be a train engineer. And last but not least, if you wore a hat like this, what would your job be? Well, you would be a chef, right? Yeah. You know, sometimes it's really hard to tell what people do for a living if they don't wear a special uniform or a hat. For example, what about a teacher? If you saw someone in the park, would you know that they're a teacher? Probably not. I mean, you would know when they're standing in front of your classroom or if you've met them, but you wouldn't know it if you just saw someone at the park. Or what about me? If you saw me in the grocery store, would you know that I share the love of Jesus with children here at Trinity just by looking at me? Probably not. And the same was true for Jesus when he was here on earth. You see, he looked and he dressed like all of the other people around him. He didn't have a sign that said, this, I'm Jesus. He didn't wear a special t-shirt or a certain hat or a crown. He looked like everyone else. But he was curious to know what people thought of him. So he was with his disciples, and in today's gospel lesson, we hear him ask this question, who do men say that I am? And the disciples answered him, and one of them said, well, they say you're John the Baptist. And others said, well, they say you're Elijah or a prophet. But Jesus asked an even deeper question of his disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter declares, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I imagine all the other disciples around him were going, yeah, good answer, Peter, great job, way to go. And Jesus said the same. He told Peter that he was blessed. And he said, Simon, son of John, I am going to call you Peter, which means the rock. And it is on this rock that I will build my church. But sadly, today, there are so many people who don't know who Jesus is. If you ask them, 
They might say, well, he was a great teacher. They might say he was a religious leader. Some may even say he was a prophet. They don't know what Peter knew or what you and I know is that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the promised Savior who came, died on the cross, and rose again to give us the forgiveness of sins and the free gift of eternal life. And that is amazing news that we need to declare to all people. But now I have a question for you today. Who are you? If someone asks, who are you? How would you answer them? Well, you might answer them by telling them your name or that you're so-and-so's brother or sister or so-and-so's son or daughter. You might say, I'm a good student or a good athlete or a good friend. And all of those things are wonderful. But they are just a very small part of who you are. Because you see, you are a child of God. He loves you, and he has made you his own. And because we know that, because we know of Jesus' saving love for us, we're going to declare that to the whole world. So how do people know who we are? Can they tell we are Christians just by talking to us or looking at us? Well, you know, we can share the love of Christ that is in us and flowing through us through our words, and through our actions. We can tell others about Jesus so that they know who he is, and they too can become his friend. And we can show people that we care for them through our actions and our words. You know, our words say a lot about us. How we talk to one another, how we treat one another, shows the love of Christ flowing through us. And how we care for others and share with others and through our actions let people know that we love God and we love our neighbor. So we want to be like Peter. We want to boldly go and share the love of Christ with everyone, declaring he is the Christ, the promised Savior, the Son of God. So we're going to pray now. And we're going to pray like we do each week. I'm going to pray a line, and then you're going to repeat that and pray it back to God. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Help us to live our lives through our words and actions as living examples of your love. Help us to declare Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next time. The gospel lesson for this day comes from Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, you came to set us free from the pressures and the binding forces of this world and to transform us into your people. Lord, help us this day to turn to you, to receive your grace, to receive the work that you would accomplish in us. Pray this in your name. Amen.
So I was cleaning the house the other day looking for something else, and I came across some Play-Doh and the set of Play-Doh molds that our kids used to play with. I don't know how long it's been since you played with Play-Doh. It's kind of fun, right, to mold things and shape things and, and then to take those, those forms and kind of you press the Play-Doh in and, and out pops some other new shape. Of course, the secret to those molds was really that you had to really pack the Play-Doh in there tightly and really force it in so it filled out all of those tiny little crevices so that when you popped open that mold, out would pop this little shape or this little figurine. Well, Play-Doh's fun to play with, but, but that idea of being compressed into a mold, that doesn't sound so fun if that was what was being applied to us. And yet that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says the world is trying to do to us each and every day. So how do we break free from that pressure? And how do we live the lives that God desires and intends for us to live? Paul's answer here in this letter to the, to the Christians in Rome, in this letter of Romans, is to not be conformed by the world, but instead to be transformed by the power of Jesus. So that's what we want to take a look at today as we dive into this text from the letter to the Romans. How are we transformed by this power of Jesus? Let me set the stage. For the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul has been laying out this great story of what God has done. The letter of Romans is Paul's most complete work of theology, and he talks about this righteousness that is made ours by faith not by works. And so he contrasts living by works of law to working and living by grace. And he explains how both Jew and Gentile are included in this promise. And then after all of this great and this beautiful and this high theology about who God is and how he relates to his world, then in chapter 12 comes this shift. Paul begins this with this great word, therefore, with that word, therefore, Paul is pivoting from all of this, this great theology, but this somewhat abstract theology about God, into this very practical application of what does it mean for you and I as a follower of Jesus. Paul says this, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, in view of all the stuff that has happened in the last 11 chapters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your true spiritual worship. Not just that we would pause to worship Jesus once a week, whether it's through one of these online services or you come here on a Sunday morning, not just that, but every aspect of our lives is to be an act of worship and service to God. So that when we go to our jobs on Monday morning, or commute from home, as we're caring for our family, as we're visiting with a neighbor out in the yard, that all of these moments as we're, we're serving and we're caring for others, that these are an act of worship and praise as we live out the pattern of life that He has designed for us. And Paul says, as he encourages us towards this, he says, I urge you in view of God's mercy. This word urge is a, is a strong word. It is to ask, to encourage, to exhort. It was the word that would be used by a commander as he was preparing his troops for battle. I urge you to be brave and, and to persevere in this fight, knowing that they were going to face something hard and difficult and challenge. He would urge and exhort them and, and appeal to them to stand against those pressures. Paul is saying something similar here. This act of offering ourselves to God as an act of worship every day, every moment of our lives, it's going to be challenging. And, and, and the world is going to be opposed to us living this way. So how do we follow this instruction? Well, Paul provides the answer in chapter 12, verse 2. 
He gives us two commands, a negative one and a positive one. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. First of those commands, the negative one is this, is do not be conformed. And what I want you to notice here is that while this is a command, it's also in the passive voice, which I know this is sort of technical, but that means that you're not the subject. You're not the one doing the action. Instead, in a passive verb, there's another subject that is acting on you. Don't be conformed because there's this outside force that is acting on you, trying to conform you. There's that, that Plato idea again. The world is acting on us, trying to force us, trying to compress us into its mold of how it thinks we should look and act and behave. And Paul is saying, don't be conformed to that image. Well, what is that image that the world is trying to conform us into? First, it's the image of materialism. It's, it's, it's the belief that this, this world and this life is all there is, and so our job is to go out and make the most of it and to get as much pleasure out of it as we can. Pleasure and possessions and, and positions of power. Life is defined by these things. And if only I could have this or have that or accomplish that, then my life would really be something. That's what the world would tell us. And yet, if you look at the people who are fabulously wealthy and fabulously successful or popular, if you really study their lives, many of them look as if they're absolutely miserable. So the world would tell us that these, these pleasures, which are legitimate pleasures that God has created, when those become the sum total of life, and when life becomes all about having those things by whatever means necessary, even illegitimate means, then we come up short and empty. There's still something missing. And yet the world is still constantly pushing on us, constantly trying to, to force us into this, to get us to conform and to buy in from social media influencers to, to the magazine rack while you're standing in line in the grocery store check-in, to all of those advertisements on those free websites or apps that really aren't free because they're paid by that advertising, all of it is a pressure to try to get you to buy into this worldview that life consists of pleasures and possessions and power and all of this stuff rather than it being defined by love and care and relationships. And so the Bible's message to us is this, is do not be conformed. This passive command. Yes, there is this outside pressure pushing in on you, forcing you into this mold, but don't be conformed to that. Resist that pressure and hold on to God. Another area where the world would seek to conform us in its image and force us to see things its way is in the realm of politics. So we live in this culture that has become absolutely polarized, and every issue now comes to be seen through the lens of politics, whether it's the issue of whether we should wear masks or not, or how and when school, schools should reopen, or whether we can trust the post office. All of a sudden, all of these issues are political issues, and they're life or death issues. There is, there is no black or no gray. There's only black or white. And Satan, who loves division, he's having a field day with this, pitting people against each other. I don't mean to say that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. We should. And I don't mean to promote one party over the other. My point is this. When our worldview is shaped more by politics than it is by the Bible and by, by the love of Jesus, then we have been conformed into the image of the world. And here's some warning signs that I see that, that tell us that this is happening to Christians. When I see Christians who are far more passionate about politics than they are about sharing their faith, 
when I see Christians who are in total lockstep with one party's platform and who can't possibly fathom how any thinking Christian could possibly have a reason for voting another way on another issue. When I see Christians post these absolutely scathing comments on Facebook with no kindness and no compassion for somebody who sees the issue a different way. When I see a Christian act as if our entire future depends on who gets elected come this November. No, my friends, our future depends on God. The biggest divide is not Republican versus Democrat, but between those who know Jesus and whose future is secure in Him and those who don't and who still need to hear about Him. Our faith should inform our politics, not our politics informing our faith. And when we see the world primarily through the lens of politics and through the lens of the political party and the platform they have put together, then it means that we have been conformed by the world. Another area where I see ourselves becoming conformed to the world is, is in the issue of, of, of race relations. We know that our society is having this large conversation around it. But as I've studied this topic and watched how groups have interacted, I've seen a number of different positions. And, and again, we're being polarized into these camps. And neither side is understanding the love and the forgiveness and the reconciliation that comes through Jesus. And so we as Christians have an important voice to speak into this matter of racial reconciliation instead of being conformed into one of these other two camps that doesn't have the solution Jesus would offer to the problem of racism. It's an important place for us to step forward. And Paul would say, don't be conformed. Stop allowing yourselves to be conformed to the world's ways of thinking. Don't give in to those pressures. Yes, there are these outside forces, and yes, they're pushing on you. Resist them. Don't allow them to control you and to define you. And then comes this next command Paul offers. That's how we resist this pressure to conform. Paul says this, be transformed. And again, this is an imperative. It's a command, but it's also a passive voice verb. It's something that's being done to you. You, again, are not the primary actor here in being transformed. You cannot conform yourself to the image of Christ. You cannot force yourself by hard effort and action and trying to love people enough and to be good enough and to live like Jesus. You can't white-knuckle your way into the kingdom of God doesn't work that way. It's not within our power to live into the fullness of what God wants for us. Instead, it comes as God comes and He acts on us. Remember, Paul spent the first 11 chapters of Romans laying out this theology of God and who He is and what He is, has done by rescuing us from the power of sin and death and the devil and the grave and setting us free so that we can live who we were supposed to be. And Paul says, in view of God's mercies, in view of all these things that God has done for you, Offer yourselves as living sacrifices. God acts from outside of us to come and to remake us and to reform us into the image of Christ. But He's not conforming us. He's not forcing us unwillingly against our desires into some Plato mold that we don't want to be a part of. Instead, the word Paul uses here is the word be transformed. The word here is the same Greek word that gives us the word for metamorphosis. That's the process a caterpillar goes through as it pulls into that cocoon and then it emerges as a butterfly. It's a transformation from the inside out. And so too, you and I are being transformed by the power of God at work in us from the inside out. 
That's why the ancient Christian church adopted the image of a butterfly, of one of the symbols for the church. Because just as Jesus died on the cross and then spent three days in the tomb before rising to new life and defeating sin and death, so to you and I, day after day, go through this process of daily dying to sin and rising to new life in Jesus, death and rebirth as Christ transforms us from the inside out. How does that happen? How does that process of transformation from the inside out happen if it doesn't happen by external rules and regulations and pressures from the outside? Well, God works through what we call in the church we call the means of grace. The means of grace are the means by which God brings His grace and His forgiveness and His love into our lives. And the means of grace are this. They are the Word and the sacraments. God's Word, the Bible, when it is read, when it is proclaimed, when we study it, when we speak it to friends, when we hear it in these worship services, it is at work at you to transform you from the inside out. And the sacraments, baptism, where God comes and washes you and joins you into the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And communion, where we come and we we participate in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. His body and blood that that were shed on the cross. When we come and we participate, that body and blood, that bread and wine, and consume it and eat it, and it's metabolized within us. And it begins to transform us from the inside out. Be transformed. It's a passive command. We can't force ourselves to transform. God has to do it from the inside out. And yet this too is a command. There is a part for us to play in this. We can't force ourselves to transform, but we can open ourselves up to the means of grace. We do have the option of whether or not we're going to tune in online to participate in these services and be reminded of His grace. We do have the option of deciding whether or not we're going to make the time to come and receive that gift of communion. We make the decision to set aside time to read His Word. And because these means of grace operate best within community, we have the opportunity to make that decision to to join with other brothers and sisters in Christ and to gather with them to allow God to work through them to shape our lives and to bring these means of grace to bear on us. So make time, my friends, to use and to receive these means of grace. Yes, we know that the coronavirus and the pandemic is putting up all sorts of barriers towards you coming out and getting involved and getting together with people. And we know there are lots of pressures in this world that would still distract you and keep you away from these things and lure you away. And yet still, we, we as Christians, we make time to make use of these means of grace. Do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the power of God that is work in you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. We join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in the song of the day. Have you 
come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Regrets and mistakes Come today There's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows And trade them for joy From the ashes A new life is born Jesus is calling Oh come to As you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Let us pray now for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, we rejoice that you have claimed us as your own. Help us to continually to resist the pressures of this world and to be transformed by the power of your grace at work in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who mourn the death of loved ones. We pray especially for the family of Glenn Bodling, who died recently. Comfort those who mourn by reminding them of your promise that all who die in Christ will live forever with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who need your healing power. We pray for Glenda Bischoff, Myrna Dubois, Randy Fassold, Gwenda Hawk, Jan Jones, Martha Mocker, Don Molenkamp, Mike Bennett, Dwayne Carmine, Angela Klein, as well as those we name in our hearts before you now. Grant to each renewed health according to your will. Continue also to be with those with COVID-19 and bless the efforts that are underway to develop a vaccine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for first responders, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, and others who protect us. Keep them safe as they perform their duties. Help them to serve with integrity and honor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for school administrators, school board members, teachers, parents, and students as decisions are being made about school for the fall. Give wisdom and insight to those tasked with making decisions. We pray for your blessings upon our Trinity Lutheran Church preschool as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings as we begin a planning study to discuss the space needs of a growing Shawnee campus. Give us your wisdom and insight as we seek your will and your vision as to how to move forward in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. We rejoice today with all those who celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, and other life milestones. Help us, even in difficult times, to give thanks for your blessings. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We join in our closing song. forgiven, drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, the love song born of a grateful choir. towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation some were meant to persist of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples none rings truer than this single word It's all God's children singing glory, glory Go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God.